And that is Who Dares Wins, the legendary MSAS film starring Lewis Collins. Lou, yeah. Every man wanted to be him, every woman wanted to be him as well. <laughs> Lou, Lou was a lad and uh, uh, a great character and, uh, you know, he was the James Bond we never had. Anyway, right. Where do you want to go now? Yes, I'm going to put, I'm going to go and cut. Now we're going to talk about Robin of Sherwood, which was, oh, yeah. which was huge in the 80s. Am I right? It was probably, I don't think that show could be made now, Chris, to be honest with you. Um, not for the money. And, and again, it was of its time. And uh, it was almost like a time bubble, a time capsule in a way, because not just uh, the contents of the show. And I think I'm actually proud of the fact that um, for those that don't remember, uh, God, what was her name? I just had it. A name flipped through my head. She was, was it Wallace, the lady that was the moral arbiter of the UK? I was actually in a show that um, Marjorie, no, what was her name? She was the woman that was the, uh, she used to complain about everything if there was too much sex in it or too much violence in it. Mary Whitehouse. Mary Whitehouse. I believe that Mary Whitehouse, in fact, I know that Mary Whitehouse hated the show because we had so many, you know, things in it that were pushing the edge of, of stuff. You know, we, we, we did do a show about, you know, Satan or Lucifer. Uh, we did do a show about that. Um, and obviously about robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. So there was a lot of things that Mary Whitehouse didn't like. And there was, although we couldn't show any blood, we never showed any actual blood except tiny, tiny amounts. Uh, never any blood. It was too violent. Um, although we did go out at the watershed hour, Saturday afternoon at five, I believe. And the one show that she was really worried about went out at seven because it was a two hour, two hour thing. The Swords of Wayland went out between seven and nine. Um, and I remember Richard Carpenter, who wrote it, was in debate with Mary Whitehouse. We all watched it because I was fascinated being involved with the show that Mary Whitehouse objected to. Um, and uh, she came on, I think it was a Wogan or something. And she came on and she, she got introduced and Richard Carpenter got introduced. And uh, Richard was introduced as a writer, as a TV writer. And Mary Whitehouse made this big diatribe about why Robin Sherwood was evil and satanic and God knows what else. And uh, Richard Carpenter just said, he said, all right, so look, he said, let's just start this. I'm a television writer. I write fiction. I write shows about historical characters like Robin Hood, Robin Hood or, you know, you know, Dick Turpin or whatever. But they're, they're entertainment. They're, you know, they're based on fantasies. I'm not a professional television critic and pundit like Mary Whitehouse. And Mary Whitehouse said, I'm not professional. Nobody pays me for what I do. And he said, ah, so I'm dealing with an amateur. An amateur with an opinion. And then he proceeded to take Mary Whitehouse <laughs> limb from limb to pieces. So, yeah, Robin of its day was very much of a time. Everybody wanted to be in the show. Lou Collins did an episode. I was given responsibility for making sure I didn't get in any trouble, where he played Robert Mark, the new sheriff of Nottingham. Lou came and did a show. Martin Shaw came and did a little guest star. Everybody did. Ian Ogilvy, Ian out there, mate. Uh, the Saint, he came and did a guest show. Everybody came and did an episode. It and, was the um, whole... One of my all-time heroes is, is, alongside your good self, Mark, of course, uh, Ray Winston. Ray, yeah. Ray. Can I, can I, can I just explain why I, I love this man? Um, bear with me. Let us get us back on. He made a film that had a real big impact on my understanding of life, especially coming from the, um, let's just say, you know, my, my background. Um, I'm just going to get flash up a picture. It was this one here. So, Ray, if you ever get to watch this, you, Kathy Burke, were just absolutely brilliant in it. 
um, and it and it really helped me to understand um, the sins of generations. Nil by mouth. That's the one. That's the picture I'm showing. I was in it. Really. And my scenes were cut by Gary um, because my scenes were too violent for the American audience. I heard it. You, he said you were too handsome. You. Well, he did say that as well, but only to me afterwards in the bar. Um, but actually, no, the, the real reasons uh, he told me himself um, in, in L.A. was uh, he said he had to cut the scene because it was it was um, actually too violent and too racist. And an American audience just wouldn't um, have it, particularly after the scenes that you've seen. Ray's performance in that and Kathy Burke. Uh, absolutely. Brilliant, absolutely amazing performances. And didn't they, uh, um, didn't they walk the red carpet for this one? I think it probably got, um, like Tim Roth's one, Warzone. He did a film as well called Warzone for Tim Roth, which I think got awards, but only in Britain because I don't think anybody else really understood it. Um, Nil by Mouth, I certainly don't think people got it, but there's there's a lot of people would an American audience, I don't think probably some of them might have. It's, it was very a very British film, as you say, and um, Gary wanted to make his film, and he did. Uh, he was allowed to. He, he was allowed to do that because the, basically the money went go make your film. And I'll always remember being on the set with him once, um, and he said something that was actually so as a, for an actor was such a relief. And it was a scene where Ray was coming into the police station. This was all ended up being cut out of the film. And Ray comes into the police station and he's meeting his mate, who was me, he was a policeman, right? And um, he comes into the police station. As he walked in, Ray kind of went from one side to the next. And the cameraman said, we have to shoot this again because he keeps crossing the line, which is a very technical thing to do in the film business, crossing the line, which way you come from. He keeps crossing the line. And, and Gary was like, I don't. What do you mean crossing the line? He's walking into the thing. He says, "Yeah, but he's it he crosses the line. It's confusing if he wants to shoot a reverse and all that." And Gary said, "I'm watching Ray's face. If anybody watching this scene is going, he's crossed the line. I shouldn't be directing this film." He said, "I. This is you know. I'm looking at Ray's emotional journey on the film. Technically, nobody cares about it, and I don't." Just keep doing what. So we did. And I thought to myself, Gary knows what he's doing. He knows what he wants. and He'll make a, a very powerful film. And he did. I mean, it's a powerful piece of filmmaking. It's one of the friends at home. If you, I, I'll, I'll see if there's a, if I can put a link for, for, for it below. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I can find a copy. Um, it was, it was a bloody good film to what it was so engrossing. Uh, in engrossing is that the right word? I'm, I don't know. Yeah, it, like it made you just you were glued to the screen. Yeah, the yeah. Acting was just British acting at its best. Um, but as I said, the 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 bit I what what's the what was the son called in it? Absolutely. Yeah, he fr um, brilliant um, actor, and he worked with me on King Arthur. I did King Arthur in Ireland with. Uh, with Ray as well and he was in that as well and we chatted about that because I think he at one time had some I want to make sure I've got the right person that if you're looking at IMDB you want to dig it up yeah because uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing and we talked again about that journey with what we talked about earlier on and uh he kind of been on that journey and and got himself but uh child oh, I don't want to say the wrong name so I don't want to get sued and don't want to get us sued but yeah um, I'm wondering if it's um Charles Creed Miles, let me just have a look. So he can sue you then if he wants to. But I think he'd been on a, a, a yeah, Charlie Crit Challenge. I think he'd been um, on an interesting journey. Let's put it that way. Uh, and I think the film was, was you know, but it's not a film, I'm going to be honest with you, it, it's not a film that I would want to watch twice or three times and sit there on a Sunday afternoon. It is more of an of a emotional battering than anything else. But there is that beautiful scene Yet there are the most tender moments where the women are all dancing together at the uh, with her mum. She's dancing with her mum. Yeah. Oh, 
God, that is so Northern England as well. I know it's set in London, but there's so many parts of it you go, oh, God, I understand that. And the women are comforting each other and just dancing together. I went, oh, God, heartbreaking. Yeah, it was set, anyway. where, it was set where I was born, South East London. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reason, uh, uh, not just not just the fact it's an exceptional film and the acting in it is just just class, but it's the bit where I, I yes, Charlie Creed Miles. It, it, actors always look so different in depending on the stage in their life, as as with your good self, Mark, looking at you in 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 Robin there. I had um, hair, but also depending on what role they're in, they've got different. Uh, 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 appendages on their face is that the right word i don't know but the, the bit where he goes my dad shot my fucking dog and then i i got it i got i got the whole thing the film was trying to say it was the intergenerational yeah uh um descendancy if that's again the right word of abuse you know how these these sins of the father come down through the family or or, or mother or, or granddad or what, whatever it might be, um, and how they manifest to to those of us with traumatic child, you know, we've and how addiction, um, you know, pop rears its ugly head in 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 later life. Just absolutely brilliant. But sorry, we 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 went we went no. off Robin there a bit. But well, let's go back to get to Ray for a second because I think it's important. Um, uh, Ray box for England. He box for Repton Club. So Ray is staunch. He's got the heart of a lion, and I can honestly say he's not changed. Uh, in the 35 plus years that I have known him and his wife Elaine and um, I'm very honoured and very proud to, to call myself his friend and I, I have to say that those friendships were formed uh, during Robin because I think there was a very early recognition between Clive, Ray, Pete Williams, myself and even and even Michael Bray to some extent that what we just launched ourselves into was um, an adventure. Nobody had done this before. And it's bizarre because when Ian actually told me about this, I was actually working with a writer called Ranul Graham that used to produce, he wrote Sweeney's and Minders and all kinds of stuff. And when he told me he was doing a new show, Robin Hood, I was actually kind of poo-pooey about it. And, and he, Ian was like, you wait, you wait, right? So I got the first script and went, yeah, this is not Richard Green. This is very different. And so we were all pretty much aware from the very beginning. And it bonded us because we had to go to Stevie Dent's farm, Steve Dent, the now the world-famous stunt coordinator. And we all did our archery and sword play and knife fighting and everything else. We had two weeks of riding horses and learning to handle horses and all that kind of stuff. And there was an element of danger in it, which you're not allowed now, really, I mean, horses themselves are dangerous. So we had to understand uh, the dangers of that. Uh, but archery and sword play and all that kind of stuff with Teddy Walsh and Gabe Cronley. And it bonded us into a little unit. And so for three years of our lives, we were the Merry Men. And that friendship has survived all these years. And um, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. And Ray is. I'm pointing to our friends at home. The man in the picture is this man. It's your, your <laughs> friendly assassin. The friendly assassin. And that came about, the truth is, because there's much talked about the legend. So it but was it, Naz, Naz. Nazir. Nazir. Yeah, which means the hawk. And um, uh, I was going to originally be called Edmund the Archer. And the character in the original script was Edmund the Archer. On the first day of filming, Ian Sharp came up to me and he said, um, uh, how do you feel about being called Nazir the Saracen? And uh, can you do a sword fight with two swords? And I said, uh, uh, yeah, fine. How long have I got? And he said, oh, about 15 minutes. I went, okay. So Teddy Walsh and I went and chose some fight swords we could actually fight with, with two-handed sword fighting style. Luckily, I'd done some, so I knew what I was doing. 
And uh, Michael Prade and I went behind the uh, trailers and bashed the crap out of each other for two weeks. And we put together the sword fight, which is now the one where Nazir becomes a merry man. And so during the course of that, Ian Sharp asking me that, then Paul Knight asked me, um, uh, the writer, which this had never happened. This will never happen in television, probably ever again. Uh, Richard come to recall me and said, OK, we've got this character. Um, I didn't intend for it to be in the show, but it's going to end up in the show. Um, it's now called Nazir the Saracen. Um, have you got any ideas of what you would like to do with this character? And I said to Richard, the Kip, I said, uh, I actually, just before we started this, was reading Runciman's History of the Crusades. So Stephen Runciman wrote three of the best books, uh, three three books, and I've read all three volumes of so Runciman, Stephen Runciman's History of the Crusades. So I said, I happen to know there's a, a strong relationship between the cult of the assassins and the Knights Templar and their relationship and how they traded. And Richard Carpenter went, we'll use that. I'll use that. He said, but there's no dialogue. He said, I really haven't written any dialogue for you. I don't know if I could actually... I, I said, I don't want the dialogue, kid. Give me the action. Give me the knife throwing, the sword fights, the horse riding. Give me the archery. Give me the tracking, the trailing. Give me all that. I don't need the dialogue. I'm, I work on the Clint Eastwood style of acting. If I can do it without saying the words, I will. So you don't need to give me dialogue. Give me the action. And he went, done. And that's what they did. So that's where Nazir the Saracen, his origins grew out of that. My gosh, can we just explore a bit the term assassin? Yes. As in the Mid in Middle Eastern term. Am I right in thinking that these assassins, they used to smoke hashish, has it? And that's where the name. Well, that's the origin of the word. Um, assassin comes from hashashin or hashishim, um, uh, which was apparently the origin of that. And the old, what they called the old man of the mountain. Their fortress was on top of, I can't remember, was it Aleppo or somewhere else now? It's gone out of my head. But they had a fortress on the top of a mountain. And the idea was that they recruited people by visiting the, 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 the castle. And they had literally all the wine, all the slave girls, all the basically the harems, everything you could want. And, and the old man of the mountain would say, if you think this is heaven, you wait till you get to the real heaven after you carry out the mission, right? So they got loaded. They had a you know few spliffs, and uh, and they were in heaven. They could have anything they wanted, anything of beauty that was there. And um, they went to, on their missions believing it didn't matter whether they died on their mission or not because they were going to uh, heaven afterwards, which has kind of been carried on in some traditions with suicide bombers and things like that. So... Um, that's where part of the origin came from. Of course, it was politically used by both the Crusaders and the, the Knights Templar. Uh, sometimes they worked, they were completely, um, although they were Muslim by origin, they did work sometimes with the Crusaders and for the Crusaders, and sometimes they worked with the, uh, uh, they, they apparently tried to assassinate Saladin as well at one time or another. Um, so they were pretty open to about who they actually got paid to, you know, assassinate. But yes, that's the, the that's part of the history. Was they smoked uh, hashish and uh, had been mm. given all these these pleasures. Back to your Robin's story then. So, and you're allowed to lie about this, Mark. That's absolutely fine. Don't shatter my illusion here illusion. Or, or my reality. Um, I'm betting you got lots of girls when you made this series. Uh, I have to say there's many stories about this. And, uh, and um, it, we were like rock stars. And, um, but everybody had uh, either stable relationships. I mean, Ray was married, you know what I mean? And he was, he was you know, um, uh, very well behaved, as was Clivey, uh, and all the guys. We, we just actually were more interested in doing the work. Um, and the one time that I did see something that I was, was, was Michael Prey, we were out some doing a disco, 
and we've been invited to this disco and uh, Clive will tell you this story as well. We walked in, because I was never much interested in people. I don't think, you know, uh, everybody was interested in Michael Prey. They weren't interested in the Merry Men. Um, and Michael walked in and this woman flew across the room and it was like uh, something out of Alien, you know what I mean? Like a face sucker. She literally just went... <laughs> Locked onto him, threw her legs around him, and he couldn't peel her off. So she, he had this girl literally stuck to his face. He was like trying to get one of those things that aliens offered. And um, I think Clive and I, we couldn't move for laughing, but we, we weren't envious. Let's put it this way. We weren't envious of that. Michael was the big heartthrob. He was the one that all the girls were. were at. We, we, we Trust me, we weren't, uh, we weren't big enough fish for uh, any of that kind of stuff. Mate, believe me, you don't you don't want that stuff in your life. It's it's hard work, yeah. It yeah, is. well, we were all focused on the work, like I say, really, and it was physically taxing a lot of days. You came back sore from horse riding or for or nicks and cuts and little dinks that you got from what you were doing. You know, there were long days, you know, and, and we actually started the, the last series. We started literally in February or something or March, and it was freezing cold that's why you see us all in furs and with my head wrapped around the terminal we were absolutely freezing cold so it was hard it was physically hard work yes i bet can you was it boring at times i mean all this waiting around on set that we hear about is it uh, did you have did you have your what is it your not your caravan what's the word for your your trainer. We had, we had a caravan that was had been hired from one of the blokes on the set. That was his weekend escape caravan or something. We had a caravan that all of us sat in uh, in a golf course somewhere while we were waiting to shoot. Uh, or it's a golf course now. It wasn't a golf course probably then. But um, we we didn't really have trailers. We had a bus, which was the dining bus. Uh, I think we had a trailer on the last series. We could afford it, actually, of a, 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 a caravan. Um there was a lot. There is a lot of hanging about, but but um, if you're a member of uh, of the main cast, you're probably like we were. We we're more busy than you would um, imagine, and when we weren't doing that, we were rehearsing sword fights or practicing sword fights. And in fact, the only time that remind that springs to mind when I actually took a break and disappeared into the woods, because even then, sometimes I was like. I have to clear my head, you know what I mean? I actually, we were shooting somewhere and we were sitting around waiting for another scene between somebody else. I can't remember what happened. And um, I just went for a walk for the woods, climbed up a tree, and I remember sitting on this big branch in my costume. Um, uh, and I had a flashback to me being a young boy in Sherwood, in Sherwood Forest playing in the Major Oak, which I did, because I grew up in Yorkshire, just down the road from Sherwood Forest or Clumber Park. So as a child, I was allowed to play in Robin Hood's Major Oak. You can't, you're not allowed near it now because some idiot set fire to it. But um, when I was a kid, in fact, there are photographs of my parents, my grandparents, all at Robin Hood's Oak in Clumber Park in Sherwood Forest. I so um, my... I was sat at the tree thinking literally about how weird life was that I end up in a forest in a show about Robin Hood and I'm sitting up a tree listening to the birds and yeah, yeah. yeah that's the one moment I remember thinking ah. how bizarre yes my my bizarre Sherwood Forest story is on my 50th birthday I ran 108, 108 miles non-stop through Sherwood Forest bloody hell good for you and that that was at the end of a quadruple Ironman, so I'd, I'd, I'd have to go in eight miles now, let alone 108 miles. Yes. I'd have to go 800 feet, let alone eight, eight, eight miles. But if the interesting thing about that is if you just saw the recent documentary about Prince Charles, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, Philip, Prince Philip, um, although Prince Charles is in it, Prince Philip, where he, he does a drive round Windsor. I actually found it very, very um, moving. I, I I was in his presence a couple of times. I won't say I, I was ever introduced to him because I wasn't, because he was, in fact, the Colonel in Chief of the Intelligence Corps. So I was kind of in his presence a couple of times. Um, and, he, and he seemed to be an absolute gentleman, just very 
understated, under, you know, just the grey man, really, in a way. And um, until he was public, you know, I mean, then he had to do his, his job and he did. But the rest of the time, he seemed to be just a, you know, just a gentleman. And he does a whole spiel about Hearn the Hunter in Windsor Great Park, which is, of course, one of the legends, where it comes from, where one of the gamekeepers used to wear antlers on his head to be able to get into the middle of the uh, herds of, 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 of deer. So he, he, talked, he talked about Hearn the Hunter. And it's funny how that legend then got spun into the, the ghost of uh, Windsor Game Park and the spirit of Hearn the Hunter. Very strange. There's some yeah. very strange hunting related uh, narratives attached to the Windsors. And I don't want to get too deep. But of course, Diana was the hunter goddess, wasn't she? Of course, yeah. In, in Greek yeah. mythology. And on their went their honeymoon the photo opportunity on their honeymoon they did it from the hunting lodge uh at, is it sandringham i, I i'm i don't uh, know um and um yeah maybe let's not go there just some very bizarre narrative oh oh and when she was buried she was buried on the, the in that island on the was it the Barrowmoral Estate or, or the sorry the Spencer Estate, and one of the someone I, I I'm not sure if it was a servant, if you use that word these days or or who but they were they said it, they were really surprised because that was where they buried their pets. You know, traditionally on on this they they buried their dogs there but basically and diana the hunt the hunter was always pictured if you look at her statues with a dog and the alleged fear uno that they believed hit the car in the tunnel and this is true it was it belonged to a uh, some immigrant, uh, like for example, an Albanian immigrant to Paris or something, they 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 found this guy and he painted the car orange to hide the the identity of it. But the witnesses said, yeah, that it was a white Fiat Uno and it had a big dog in the passenger seat. And yes, he this this guy had a had a dog. So yes, um, gets even deeper again when you go under the streets of Paris in that area. Uh, gosh, what is it now? It's uh, there's connotations of that that Pont de Alma, that that bridge, which just out of interest has the Illuminati flame on on top of it, which just makes things that little bit more. Um, kind of bizarre again can we say but um yeah there's there's some link to that area of paris that has some real esoteric um like hit history behind it but ah anyway let's let's if you look at my if you ever look at any of my tarot cards you will see because we use the goddess the the, the idea of the goddess with the hunting dogs is is thousands of years old i mean the idea of the hunting pack of dogs and the guardians you, you'll see in my tarot cards i i took that from ancient mythological history of celtic goddesses with the dog so i'm not saying that uh, there isn't a link somewhere to that but um a lot of it the name diana obviously in the huntress is uh, synonymous with the, the pet hounds and all that kind of stuff it goes way back into history yes and of course, um, yes, for people wondering, like, if I'm supposed to be, I wasn't really trying to go anywhere there. I was just highlighting some some kind of relevant hunting stories. But of course, the, the, the um, what's underpinning this narrative is, is rituals. Um, right. The rituals that the man, in, man or woman in the street don't really get involved in because we just go about our life. But... Well, to get really controversial, I do believe that Robin Hood was actually a Yorkshireman because in the actual TV show, A Wolf's Head, which was a real thing, uh, certain 
criminals were uh, called wolf's heads. And that meant that you could um, collect their head and you brought it in. Like a, if you brought in a wolf's head, you were given a penny because wolves obviously were attacking the deers and all that kind of stuff. So if you're a wolf's head criminal, it meant that you could be hunted like a wolf. Uh, but if you're a wolf's head in Nottinghamshire, you were necessarily a wolf's head in Yorkshire because it had different, obviously different boundaries. So I believe that Robin Hood from the Great North Road, which is, you know, just north of, of Nottinghamshire, where there was uh, all kinds of historical links to an actual real Robin Hood, um, that if you're going to rob people in that period, as we talked about earlier on, you're going to rob people who are travelling on the Great North Road towards York to get or to, to, to deposit or to collect money. So you rob them on the Great North Road, Watling Street, as it was known there. One of the earliest poems talks about Robin Hood going up Watling Street, which is actually the Great North Road. And so if you're going to rob people, you would do it just before or after they left uh, the, the, the Exchequer in York. So I have a, a sneaking suspicion that Robin Hood was a Yorkshireman. And he may have done a bit of Robin Hood thieving in Nottinghamshire, but then he hopped back over the border where he wasn't wanted. He wasn't a criminal in Yorkshire. He could be safe there with his ill-gotten gains. That's just my theory. I'm going to get hate mail now because all the all fans that say, no, he's from Nottingham, are going to be writing to you going, Mark Ryan, he's a Yorkshireman, drinking Yorkshire tea. That's why he's saying Robin Hood was a Yorkshireman. Yes. So many narratives, so little time. Yeah, it's a conspiracy, mate. That's what I say. Anyway. Mark, let, let, we're going to wrap it um, we're going to wrap Let's just do a quick thing, a quick thing, just a shout out to all the boys, to Ray, Clive, Jason, my everybody, uh, and just say, you know, still, literally, three years, the best I've ever spent anywhere on a set with a gang of characters. And uh, we're still friends to this day. We're still the merry men. And, and, and Ray has not changed for everything that he's done and achieved in his career. He's still better, the most brilliant artistic things that you like, Neil by Mouth, that you talked about, to the fun stuff that he's done. And obviously, stuff I've been involved with, like King Arthur. Great, great time on the set. And that's why he's beloved by people because he's, he's hasn't changed. He's the same guy. But a big shout out to all the guys and Maid Marion, to Judy, Judy Trot, everybody else, Nick Grace, Sheriff of Nottingham. I, I, I still, blessed time in my career for sure. Yes, and I look forward to hosting Ray on the podcast. Ray, if you're out there, I cannot wait to meet you. And of course, <laughs> let's not forget that that all-time classic film that woke people up to the horrors of Borstal, wasn't it? Was was scum. Um, another just uh, uh, as iconic as Quadrophenia and and all, all the rest of the great British films. Can you imagine how many people in pubs have come up to Ray and gone, come on, Ray, show us your tool. Can you imagine how many people have done that? I, it's, you know, you don't want to get your head around it. Yes, yes. There's always one thing, isn't there, with each celebrity they've got there. You've all, yeah. Yeah. If you've got a catchphrase, you're fucked. Show us your tool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you go. Imagine Larry Grayson, everywhere he went. Shut that door. <laughs> God. <laughs> Mark, absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm just going to say another thank you because I don't know how we're going to edit this little bit, but massive thanks again, mate. You're welcome. Rock You're welcome. on. Great, fun. great, great conversation. I'm sure you're going to get loads of mail. <laughs> yes. Guys, are you mad? <laughs> Oh uh, well, everyone knows that I'm mad, so that's not that's that's nothing new in that's nothing new in this household. Send me a link when you've got it up. Yeah, I will do. I will do.